Hi, Alan. How you doing? Hello. Hello. And hi, Rick. Okay. <laughs> so let's start the day, guys. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from all parts of the world who have registered for this great webinar happening today. Hope you and your family are doing safe in COVID times. Our best wishes are with all of you. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Naveen and I'll be your host for the day. I'm working as Vice President Innovation and Strategy at AI Core Spot. Further, I've been joined by my colleague Arvin and Naveen, who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to them for putting in such a hard work and making this one a huge success. We try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can gain maximum output out of the same. Let me provide a brief background to all of you about AI Core Spot. We started last year, backed up by our InfoVision, who is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, who is our technology partner. The focus here is to provide all of you a deep dive in all the sectors, wherever technology is there. And every month, the theme is different. We are gaining momentum month on month. Our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be a part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a success. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies, which encompasses AI, ML, deep learning, digital twin, robotics, AR, VR, IoT, blockchain, 5G, drone, analytics, edge AI, edge computing, cloud, and so on. We'll enrich the content through different mediums like podcasts, videos, club blogs, digital content, and newsletters to shed light on the ever-evolving industry. The focus for us is to do some great industry-backed webinars and hybrid events. How we'll get the knowledge? It will be made from reliable data through the industry leaders, subject matter experts, thought leaders, and our partners, which is InfoVision and Digit7. Today, we are having a lovely and unique webinar around the great theme, which covers impact and challenges overcome by digital insurance. So if you guys want to know hassle-free online insurance purchases, AI annotation, or automation for quicker claims, benefits of digital insurance, and so on, then you are in the right place. We'll go all over it throughout the panel discussion and give lots of insights to you. There are lots more in store for this month as well as subsequent months with focus on banking, financial insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, energy, utility, and so on. So request all of you to go through our website, which is aicoresport.io, for future updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months to follow. Before starting with this day, I would like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing learning and networking day. Special mention about our knowledge and innovation partner, InfoVision which is an end-to-end -end IT and business services provider specializing in providing technology transformation and innovation projects for over 25 years across multiple industries. They have over 3,000 technology professionals working across 12 global locations, including U.S., Latin America, Middle East, and India, and serves over 65 customers across different industry segments like banking, financial, telecom, media, retail, consumer goods, healthcare, and manufacturing industries. The core services which they offer includes digital engineering services comprising of cloud, big data analytics, DevOps, application services, legacy modernization, digital quality assurance, mobile API, mobile services, social media research analysis, and cybersecurity. They also have a great, unique, state-of-the-art research and innovation lab started last year named Digit7 in Richardson, Texas, with five great products, which includes DGrab, NapCart, TagSquare, DigitShells, and FlyRobo. The beauty about all the five products is that they are customizable, cost-effective, and can be used in every industry where technology is needed. With their strong technology capabilities and delivery expertise, we are sure that they can help anyone in their transformation journey, provide technology needs to build future-proof business model and excellence into once and customer experience. So to get in touch with them, kindly log on to the website, which is InfoVision.com, and leave your details through the Contact Us section. Now, moving on and coming to our community partners for today, it includes three great companies, Marsh, USA, Gallagher, and Horace Math, 
who came together to make this webinar a great success. A special mention to attendees of the event who registered and came today to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, if you gain few things out of this or get to network with each other, then our core objective as a platform will be achieved. Further, if anybody wants to ask questions, they can type it in the Q&A section, which is there on the right side of the menu option. You can type in as when the panel member speaks and we'll try to get it answered as per the time permitted. There's also a hand button at the bottom of the screen through which you can raise the hand and come to the stage in video format to ask questions to the speakers as well. So now let me hand over the stage to Yuvraj, who is AVP Handling Insurance Vertical from InfoVision, who is the moderator for this panel discussion as well. He's joined by three great leaders, Rick, who is Senior Vice President at Marsh USA, Alan, who is Senior Vice President at Gallagher, and Maceo, who is Vice President Casualty and Claims at Horace Mann. Over to you, Yuvraj, to begin this exciting panel discussion. Hey, thank you, Nitin, uh, for the context. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, wherever the time zone you guys are joining. Uh, like all of you, I'm also equally excited uh, to hear from these three gentlemen how insurers are using technology to transform the industry, uh, which is a key focus uh, today. Uh, let me start with Rick first uh, to understand his perspectives. Uh, how does the technology affect the insurance? Good morning, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Thank you very much for posing that question. The impact of technology on the insurance industry. Uh, often technological advancement helps to make a market more accessible and improves the way in which brands interact with their customers. Technology has transformed the insurance industry in a number of ways, making it easier for companies to collect and analyze data, reach new customers, and manage their operations. So what we're using now and, and to help you better is to understand that this is now called insure tech. And it's premised on the belief that the insurance industry is ripe for innovation and disruption. And it is, it's a staid type of industry. And with technology, it has now become something that is embracing uh, these newer developments and exploring avenues that large insurance firms have less incentive to exploit, such as offering ultra customized policies, social insurance, new streams of data from internet enabled devices, and dynamically price premiums according to observed behavior. So it's allowing for many, many things. Uh, it's very important. It enhances the customer experience. It promotes efficiency. It emphasizes individuality. It improves flexibility. It reduces operating costs and hopefully it decrease fraud. So there are so many ways that technology is helping the industry of insurance, which as I say, was slow to change and now we're embracing change, and we're going to find out in today's discussion just how much this change is going to help us and how we can utilize the change to our advantage. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, that, that really helps. Uh, maybe I can continue with that topic uh, since you touched about the changes. Maybe, Alan, if you can talk about how the organizations can effectively manage the change uh, in the technology sphere? Yeah, great question, Raj. And um, I want to just pick up on something Rick said, InsureTech is really um, a theme amongst insurers and consulting firms. Um, we're dealing with technology every day, particularly we're in our open enrollment season uh, today. So I'm actually managing about five open enrollments, um, you know, overall at the moment. And so we're using a lot of technology to be able to do that. And so what I'd look for um, from groups and from technology solutions, if we're looking at, say, benefit administration systems or HRIS systems, is the ability to integrate with one another so that systems are seamlessly integrated uh, and information shared uh, along uh, lines from the insurance company uh, to the uh, our client in their HRIS system. Everything's seamless. So you have one point of entry where you make a change and then it's blown out to um, every uh, every other part of the organization and the insurance company. Sometimes that doesn't work really well. Uh, there are some of the BUCAs particularly and some of the other insurance companies have legacy systems that are difficult to connect with and you have to uh, have analysts and technology people working on the interfaces to make sure they work. So the change that's taking place is really massive throughout the industry, um, upgrading uh, old systems, legacy systems that weren't very efficient or productive 
But when you do that, it always causes unintended consequences uh, for people. So maybe you don't get this report or you can't go into the system like you used to do. And now, you know, where's the information that I need? Um, so change is difficult for people. Um, typically, um, people are averse to change. And um, so in managing that change, you try to try to have a process by which you change things that um, have to be changed immediately for systems to work. And then you look uh, down the road, you know, maybe 18 to 24 months. And here's where we want to be in 24 months. But we're here right now. And what things have to change? What do we need to do uh, to get to where we're going in, in 24 months? So um, tremendous change going on. And um, I would say that we're trying to manage that best we can. Sometimes it doesn't work like we'd like for it to, and you have to go back and uh, go to plan B from plan A, but uh, that's all part of the part of the process. Thanks, Alan. Uh, I think uh, you pretty much covered on the change management process. Uh, would you also want to touch uh, quickly, uh, you know, because automation plays a key role in today's industry. Uh, maybe like uh, before I go to Mazio, if uh, you wanted to shed a few lights on what do we automate first? Like what does the, the organization need to think about it? Alan? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were uh, going yeah. to make you. What we need to think about first are systems that are absolutely critical. So they're mission critical systems um, that we have to have. So, for example, let's say um, we're in an open enrollment and we're trying to communicate with people in a manufacturing environment. And often those people um, are crunched for time. And so what we want to do is have systems that are efficient um, and effective at communicating with employees. So if we're on a manufacturing assembly line, then we have a QR code that um, you know an employee can snap with their phone. It takes them immediately into an open enrollment system where they're able to get information about their uh, benefit programs. They can make their choices and elections in maybe five or 10 minutes where it used to take sitting down with a counselor for 20 or 30 minutes and going through all of that. And if they have a question or something like that, they have a chat, uh, chat box, they can talk with someone or they can get someone on the phone. So we're looking for systems that are efficient where we can touch employees um, and get those mission critical things done and communicated. So also a part of that is, you know, our companies, the organization's head, uh, the CEOs may want to communicate certain things to their employees. So that's a great time during opening enrollment where you can, um, you can produce a video where the CEO can uh, communicate with employees the message that he wants them to know and that's a that's a very great time and then following up uh, once that's done with information that um, employees can file away and know, you know here are my elections uh, here's how i get back into the system if i need to make changes or if i need a question answered you know if we're dealing with a 30 or 40 thousand employee company then you have a lot of barriers to getting questions uh, answered and you, know, you often try to send people an automated route and a lot of times that's affected but sometimes you have to speak to a person and you have to be able to get in touch with somebody if you need to talk to a, a real person excellent uh, thanks alan i know we started uh, uh, at a very high level how the technology affects and you touched on the change management and the automation to start with maybe Mejo, I'll, I'll go with you uh, you know a little deeper on the pricing aspect of it right pricing plays, plays a key role uh, I, I wanted to hear your perspectives on the property and casualty pricing model, uh, how the technology is influenced with this model in our industry to start with. Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, Raj. And, and good morning, good afternoon to, to everyone. I, I talk about, I will talk about an emerging trend we saw really in the beginning of the pandemic with uh, telematic insurance pricing, uh, which is a new way to consider um, auto risk, because uh, my, my segment of the industry is property and casualty, and, and telematic usage um, is it, pretty simple, where it, it's a, a telematic box or plug-in um, or use of a smartphone app that tracks speed, uh, location, uh, time of accidents, driving, it, it, and all sorts of driving data. And this information, the data that's gathered from the smartphone apps or, or the plug-ins, um, it transmits to the insurance company for further analysis, and and this is added to a customer's personal account. And, and by tracking these behaviors, 
um, it, two benefits. Uh, for the customer, um, it's an opportunity to track, you know, how safe of a driver they are. And if we're able to determine safe driving habits, uh, then there's cheaper rates. Uh, for an insurance company, um, it's a, an opportunity for them to be a lot more accurate uh, in terms of tracking how safe a driver is um, and looking at their driving habits day to day. Um, with that said, you know, that, that method of, of, of pricing has, has certainly faced some headwinds um, with striking that right balance uh, of collecting and, and using individuals' uh, driving behavior and how it's used uh, by underwriters. So some, co um, some customers are, are just simply uncomfortable uh, with giving up that information um, and out of fear of what that insurer may do with that information. Um, as for me, I'll give you a personal story. You know, I have a team driver in the house and, and my insurance company to ensure that my household vehicles um, approached me about, hey, can you plug this device into your car and, and, and track your, your your driving habits? And for me, it was a hard no uh, because I have a team driver. You know, I, I know she's a relatively safe driver Why mom and dad's in the car, but you know, I, I can't attest uh, to how safe of a driver she is uh, when, when we're not. So so that's something that, you know, a, a lot of uh, consumers would have to consider, um, you know, as far as telematics, which is certainly an emerging trend. Well, that is that is amazing. Uh, thanks, Mr. for sharing your perspectives. Um, maybe before I go back to Rick, uh, I also wanted to hear your perspective, Mr. about uh, Today, the claim settlements plays a key role, and most of the uh, companies, uh, they are worried about the customer retention. If any, with the intense competition looming in the market, even a small bad experience on the settlement process, uh, the fear is like, hey, do I retain my customer or would they look for alternate options? So given that scenario, what type of the technology investments the insurance providers are making to stay competitive? Sure, thanks for that question. I you know, I, I have to first say that, that any new advances in, in, in technology needs to be aimed at achieving very specific value-based um, goals. You, just by introducing innovation, uh, because it's newer, will ultimately you know, have a high likelihood of failure. So you have to be very thoughtful and deliberate about you know, the capital investments that you're making as an insurer. Uh, I remember years back, I went to a conference and we were talking about technology and it was an IT person said, okay, so, you know, with technology, it could be cheap, it could be fast, it could be accurate. Pick two. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, that, that, that's really the, the thought process that a, a lot of insurers go through. But, but with that said, um, artificial insurance technology, AI, is reshaping uh, claims processing. Uh, if you consider for a moment, there are very inherent delays in the traditional claims handling process as you consider how an adjuster uh, has to gather information and process all of that data required to make a payout uh, decision. You know, with AI, you know, there's machine learning algorithms uh, that can calculate damage severity, you know, using satellite images and, and drones to explore. And it, it eliminates, you know, that human factor and, and simply cut time, you know, as well as cost. You know, you know in considering drones, you know, drones, it's playing a major role, particularly in catastrophe handling. We're right here on the hills of um, Hurricane Ian right now. You know, drones are useful uh, to be able to to determine damage, particularly when accessibility to the part um, of a neighborhood or a city is, is at issue due to that event. I recall, you know, 15 uh, years back or so, uh, I was in a meeting, and and that's when drones were more popular from a consumer standpoint. And someone in the media asked the question, hey, can we use drones? And I think it was Hurricane Ike um, because there was a lot of issues getting to those neighborhoods. And can we use drones? And it's a lot of consternation around that. And so, well, um, you know, the pushback was, I I'm not sure if we can get accurate estimates of damages. Uh, but the retort was, well, you can absolutely see when the roof is missing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it, thank goodness that, that that's something that, that's used to a greater degree now, in fact, uh, there are companies out there, um, I think EagleView is one of them, that, that their whole business model is um, on behalf of insurers will go out um, with drone usage to inspect damages. Um, I would say uh, Chatbot, which is a form of AI, 
Hmm. It's something that's been <laughs> it's, you know, it's predicted about 85% uh, of customer interactions uh, are going to be uh, with AI chatbots. And, you know, just consider for a moment that, you know, customers with the ability to use chatbots uh, for the claims management it empowers them, you know, to have accessibility and, and, and drive their claim forward 24 hours a day. So, you know, a, a lot of opportunities out there from a technology standpoint. Uh, but I say again, um, you know, with my organization, we, we think very critically on on what we're trying to solve and what we're trying to achieve uh, before we make those capital investments. That makes sense. Uh, thanks, Michio. Uh, I think you brought in some of the real experiences what all of us are going through. I think that resonates well with this crowd as well. Uh, I started uh, getting questions from the audience before I go there. Maybe, Arvind, if I ask you, uh, interest of time, if you can post the poll question to the audience as well. Absolutely. And uh, Rick, back to you. You know, in the beginning of the uh, question, you also talked about um, the insure tech as well. I wanted to hear a little bit more about what is this insure tech, right? And how the insurers are using it. Oh, sure. I'd love to chime in. I think we're, we've, we've touched on so many uh, topics that are of interest in what technology is doing. And, and, and we're wondering if insure tech is the future and, and, how companies are using it. But InsureTech is simply the combination of insurance and technology. Uh, it's any technology that's used by insurance companies to streamline their operations and provide a better service or save money. Those are the goals. Uh, they include chatbots, which uh, Maceo touched on, smartphone apps. It's a big business. It's more than $16.5 billion in funding flowed to insurance uh, InsureTech startups between 2010 and 2019. I mean, we can speak to the fact that geolocation tracking of cars will help uh, companies build more finely delineated groupings of risk, allowing products to be priced more competitively. Uh, they, they, they allow so many things to be done. They enhance the customer experience I touched on before by leveraging technology. Custom, customers are more engaged in selecting their coverage, understanding their needs, getting personalized service. They don't travel to a branch. They don't have to do that online, uh, like everything else remotely. Uh, we saw how important that is during the pandemic. And we're seeing from the pandemic uh, things now being continued uh, for our lives to be made easier. Uh, it also promotes efficiency. So they can uh, they don't have to wait for business hours for an available representative. Uh, they can get answers quickly, access information quickly. Uh, they they have individuality. So not only are the uh, the premiums and coverages tailored more specifically to them, uh, but they they improve pricing. Uh, it's more flexible. Uh, it reduces operating costs uh, with the with the advent of AI, uh, where we're helping with AI in in the fact that um, we're we're able to gain so much and not have to have humans dedicated to doing tasks that required human, they're now being performed uh, by AI, the chatbots that we talked about. So this all is providing automation and uh, creating data warehouses, uh, automatically compiling policies ready for signatures. There are so many things we touched on, drones, uh, they assess property, evaluate property damage, and, and, and even with the, especially with, not even with, but especially with things like claims management, uh, we, we were, I'm not involved with claims so much on my end, uh, but it's certainly important to me and larger companies can now leverage technology to gather and aggregate specific data points regarding specific claims. So there are so many areas, there's so many companies, I'm not going to name each company, but they are now able to sell directly to the customer uh, some companies on a smaller scale, as opposed to being transmitted via brokers, some policies that uh, individuals can go online and get without having to go through someone else. Uh, you can they use phones and smart watches to gather information. Uh, this helps as well. And uh, all of this is moving forward. So uh, I'm going to save another topic for a little more of our discussion. But there are some criticisms, too. So to be perfectly upfront, 
a lot of these are not even received by the public at large as good for them. So there are some criticisms. Whether or not they're uh, valid remains to be seen, but we are experiencing some criticism, cri criticisms of things that are being implemented. So everything is not on the positive side either, and that's going to form and shape the future for us. Thanks, Rick. Absolutely. Uh, like you rightly said, post-pandemic, the adoption is excellent, right? Uh, we never expect this much of uh, volume, and especially with a new behavior, all these things are really going to help us, help the companies to have more, uh, uh, you know, control over it, right? Uh, now, one thing which, before we go to the next question, maybe like I wanted to change a little bit, like there's a first question came from the audience. Um, I'm, I'm going to read it to you guys. And Rick, feel free to chime in or Mazio or Alan, who will want to take this. How do you address privacy concerns tracking data using telematics and user behavior? Maybe Alan, um, you're, you're speaking on mute. Yeah, can you hear me All right? No, it is better. Go ahead. Okay, okay, good. Um, since we're using sensitive um, and private data all the time um, in our um, enrollment systems and in working with our clients, then we have to make um, extremely, we have to be extremely careful with information that, um, that we're using so that it's not uh, communicated, it's not lost, and certainly we don't have issues with uh, cyber crime or um, you know, a cyber attack where we may lose data. Uh, that's one of the things I'm most concerned about with all of my clients is um, you know, that sort of identity theft and cyber crime where information is stolen and uh, we don't know how it happened. Um, sometimes our systems are, are vulnerable and we have to um, make sure that uh, we have all the firewalls up that we possibly can. We're doing everything we can to keep that from happening. But it's a big concern for us. I was had a conversation with the CEO of Honda, uh, Hyundai Motor um, Manufacturing Alabama last year. Uh, yeah. uh, with putting together, um, you know, systems and programs internally to address all of the cyber issues. And a lot of companies don't understand the liability that they actually have with cyber. They think they uh, have got it covered, but they really don't. And so you have to really... Um... Yeah. Probably, uh, yeah. Yep. And then you're... And make, make sure yep. that you have all those systems in place um, to do everything you can to keep data secure. Um, sorry for the interruption. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we got Alan. Yep, the response is uh, really good. I think uh, that addresses the question. Now, the other question came uh, regarding. Maybe I'll, I'll ask Meju about this since you touched on the claims processing. Uh, <clears throat> do you think uh, the blockchain technology can help improve or streamline or retain the claim histories for better and faster pricing and claim processing? Absolutely. And in fact, um, you know, blockchain is, is, is playing a huge role um, in our fight against insurance fraud. Uh, you know, the blockchain has the ability to record transaction data real time. Um, you know, it's a, a common practice for, for fraudsters to try and uh, file multiple claims uh, with different companies to get paid uh, for the same event. And, and blockchain has proven to be quite useful uh, in, in that regard. And so this is something that our industry, our company is using some, um, sipping our big toe uh, in the water, if you will. Uh, but it certainly um, has, has proven to be useful. Now. Hey, keep going now, Major. All right. Uh, I, I, don't going my I don't know if it's feet there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a little toe too, Maceo. I'm just kind of going sideways, you know. <laughs> 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 technology technology really <laughs> right right, right. low-tech definitely low-tech right here yeah. <laughs> uh yeah keep going uh is you, you, you finished it or yeah yep, i'll finish okay yep. by the way both the questions came from same person uh his name is natraj uh, i hope natraj got the answers for both of it 
Uh, Major, since you touched about uh, the fraud uh, side of it, um, maybe like a, I would I would like to hear more about um, what are some of the technology frameworks uh, that insurance companies are tapping into it uh, to prevent all this fraudulent because the billions of dollars spent every year across the globe. We all know that, um, and all again, it all boils down to the cost as well, right? So. What do you think, like from a, a framework perspective, which if you want to highlight few, that would be great. Sure. You, you know, first, just to frame this up, uh, you know, according to the FBI, uh, insurance fraud costs more than a hundred billion dollars. That's billion with a B uh, annually in the United States alone. Um, you know, I talked about blockchain certainly plays an important role there. Uh, artificial in- intelligence as well. You know, and, and how we use that, it, it's, you know, AI allows us to analyze patterns uh, for, for known fraudsters, you know, their locations, uh, IP addresses and accounts, and being able to flag those within the system. So when a claim uh, comes up from those known locations and IP addresses, then we have the ability to resist uh, playing those things, particularly if they have um, several NICB um, indicators that are present um, in that particular claim. So, in addition to the to the blockchain, um, AI, you know, play you know uh, plays an important part with that. Um, I would say, lastly, uh, digital signature technology. Um, it's something that that that's used to a great extent, and it's without a doubt, um, it's helping fight the the fake insurance um, account um, activations. There, you know. What's a pretty popular uh, practice is that uh, fraudsters would uh, try and, and and open up insurance policies and accounts even after the accident has taken place. And with that digital signature, there's a way to document um, the actual dates and, and to be able to resist uh, some of those practices. So, you know, Harley cuts into the 100 billion, but we're getting better and better each day. Um, the, my experience in, in the industry of 28 years with, with insurance fraud, when, when, when you build it, then they'll work really, really hard uh, to find another way around it. But, but those are some of the three uh, pillars that we're using right now, AI, blockchain, and, and digital signature technology. Thanks, Misha. Uh, you know, in interest of time, I have two or three more topics to be covered between Alan right, and Mazio. Maybe I'll, I'll start with Alan. I know this transformation is not a one day journey. We all know that, right? It's been evolving for decades. And especially the legacy system plays a critical role in most of the uh, big organizations, especially in the insurance companies. So I wanted to hear two things from you, Alan. Uh, how, how do we determine, how do the companies determine uh, which legacy systems to update and by when? And then also I wanted to hear the second part of the question is, how do we foster passion for improvement, right? And implementing technologies that transforms um, the systems and culture and the strategies. Okay, great question. And Maceo and, and Rick, I mean, just really great um, insights and comments on um, insurance. I've written, I've made a lot of notes. And so um, with um, with systems and change and change management, it's really, you don't want perfect to be the enemy of, of uh, good. So we might not have a perfect system um, when we upgrade, when we first start, but we've got a better system than we had. And so what we want to do is, again, be on that path uh, to getting things updated. So a lot of the, let's go back to the BUCAs for a minute. And I'm not picking on them necessarily. All the insurance companies are like this. United Healthcare's, Aetna, Cigna, you know, whoever it is, um, they have a lot of legacy systems in place that are very, very expensive to update. Uh, cost millions of dollars and um, a lot of time and planning to update those systems. So uh, you look at mission critical systems first and you implement those and make changes. Uh, and then you have a um, um, roadmap for what you're going to do um, to upgrade the other systems that that impacts. And so you have to all look at the human impact of automation. What's happening with uh, the human components to that? We're automating systems are there jobs that are no longer going to be necessary after we've upgraded those systems? And what do we do to address that? Can we retrain those people uh, to work in different areas? Um, I don't know. Those, those are questions that have to be asked. And so what we want to do um, is uh, look holistically at that process 
uh, so that when we make changes, they're positive changes. They're positive not only for customers uh, and for the organization, but the people that uh, work in those organizations as well. Um, I'll speak for just a second about um, about data and claims data and what I'm really interested in. Some of the AI, uh, some of the AI systems and capabilities today is I want to look at claims information, pharmacy information, medical claims information, biometric information from an employee population that I want to be able to infer from that what's going to happen in that employee population uh, two or three or four years down the road. And so we want to, um, with, with a, an eye towards preventing disease states that may be developing or may could develop based on the information we've got today. And insurance carriers, insurance companies have not been really great um, at preventive care uh, because they tend to get paid when they pay a claim. Um, and so we've got to change that. We've got to change that mentality. So what I'm interested in is being able to use data and AI to tell me what's going to happen in an employee population three or four or five years down the road and what systems and programs do we need to put in place to help alleviate some of those chronic diseases, whether it's hypertension, you know, whether it's asthma, whether it's um, people that are going to be at higher risk for heart attack and stroke, um, heart, you know, heart issues, heart attack are the number one killer in the country, both men and women. Uh, it is absolutely by far number one. So we need to pay a lot of attention to heart health uh, in our in the country, and that involves diet, exercise, and involves information on uh, what um, what drugs are we taking, what impact do those drugs have uh, on our body, and what can we do uh, to alleviate any of those uh, things that can be an issue for us down the road. So I'm interested in all of that and being able to uh, improve um, the lives of the people that uh, work for my client. Uh, and my clients as well from a cost-effective standpoint in managing that for them. Thanks, Alan. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's all great perspectives. And while we focus so many things at once, but we also miss some of the basics, right? Thanks for reminding all those. Uh, now, a uh, real question, a uh, quick to Rick. Uh, I know you uh, elaborated more about the insure tech. I also wanted to hear your perspectives how does insure tech, uh, is this the future of the insurance? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. And I, I, I was starting to talk about the fact that there are many criticisms, criticisms of insure tech to be found. Uh, many of these innovations are long overdue. And, but there are reasons why the incumbent insurance companies are so reluctant to adapt. Insurance is a highly regulated industry. There are many layers of jurisdictional legal baggage that we deal with. As such, uh, the major companies have survived uh, this long by being incredibly cautious. They shy away from working with some of these newer technologies uh, in a very stable industry. Um, it's also, it's a bigger problem than it sounds. Many of the insure tech uh, startups, they require the help of traditional insurers to handle underwriting and manage catastrophic risks. So, that said, more insure tech startups gather, uh, garner consumer interest, I should say, with a refined model and user-friendly approach. They find that the incumbent players warm to the idea of insure tech and become interested in buying up some of the innovation. So there, there's also something that we, we spoke about. And what happens is you've got a, a certain level of privacy that you relinquish when you adopt some of these technologies as well and these methodologies. Uh, consider what uh, Macia was saying about, once again, the tracking device on the, uh, the, the car of his son. I'm sure his son would be thrilled to know that he was being tracked <laughs> and uh, better off not even telling him, probably. But uh, that's another discussion. Um, you, people don't like it. I don't I don't you know, I drive 99 percent of the time. You know, I'm driving uh, like uh, the woman from Pasadena. Uh, the elderly lady from Pasadena, but there are times when, you know, I, I, uh, I, I tend to uh, let loose a little bit within reason with caution. I am an insurance guy, so uh, I, I'm always cautious and I know risk, but there are times and I don't want to be, you know, trapped. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant. I'm very much in favor of freedom. So people are a little bit nervous about, uh, you know, where something tracking where you've been, 
uh, where you visited, how long were you there? You know, if you know, my phone sometimes talks to me. I didn't ask it a question, but I find that my phone is talking to me. I'm not even asked the question. So I, I, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm not a, a conspiracy theory guy, but, you know, I start to wonder. I notice things. And so, you know, that's why people are a little bit now. Uh, how does it make money? Well, it makes money on on minimal overhead and operational efficiency. So bearing that in mind, the future is that if it continues to make money due to minimizing overhead and, and operational efficiency, there there's a huge future for it. Uh, it earns revenue for, from clients and uh, reduces costs and makes costs minimal by eliminating physical office or personnel to perform tasks that have been eliminated through chatbots or automation. So uh, due to these lower costs, insure, insure tech companies, they are able to lower uh, or for lower prices. So uh, is it better than traditional insurance? Uh, I know a lot of customers and, and a lot of my clients uh, prefer uh, traditional insurance because they want to sit down with a face-to-face -face interaction uh, with an insurance agent or a broker that they've known for years. But there are models of delivering insurance coverage that traditional insurance just can't offer. Um, you, you cannot just go online and get some. You want to buy homeowner's insurance. I don't have to get to buy homeowner's insurance. I don't have to have a relationship with my broker necessarily. But if my, if my premium is several million dollars and I've got very customizable uh, uh, problems and I'm a unique operation, then I, I don't want to go online and find insurance for my, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation and, and it's one size fits all insurance. So I see the automation as being very helpful, uh, very lucrative, but not for everyone and not for every application. So to sum it up, if you're, if you're a buyer looking to buy something, uh, car insurance, homeowners insurance, something that's transactional uh, in nature. Uh, go right ahead. You'll you'll save money, uh, and, and and through the data, you may even you'll you'll get better pricing, uh, and you don't have to have a relationship. But when you're looking at large companies, large organizations, corporations that have uh, huge huge insurance costs, we may not be there yet with technology. Maybe for the claim side, maybe uh, AI can help. Uh, we offer at Marsh a proprietary uh, desktop uh, device called Link, which offers policies and other information right on the client's desktop. So we're using that, but I don't think that I'll be replaced by a chatbot anytime soon when, you know, especially since my joke. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, I still have clients that want me to come and, you uh, Sometimes they even want to have lunch with me. So that's, that's also, <laughs> yeah, also absolutely, absolutely. So, lunch is uh, good. We like lunch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes, that's sometimes how I maintain these cheats. <laughs> so that, that's what I have to say in regard to that. And uh, thanks for listening. No, no, absolutely makes sense, right? Uh, uh, not always chatbot can do everything, right? Some of the super bots like us has to be there. <laughs> uh, question to, uh, uh, I know we have a few minutes left. Um, it's amazing. I know there are so many uh, disruptive business models in the industry, uh, but peer-to-peer, -peer, the P2P insurance is gaining popularity, right, due to uh, all this uh, technology basis. So what are the, some of the fundamentals of this model? Uh, maybe if you can share your perspectives, that would be good. Sure. Thank you. And it, it's not a whole lot out there about peer-to-peer -peer insurance. Kind of touch on some of those things that, that Rick was actually I referred to actually, but but this model entails that you have a network of people that agree to, to cover similar risk uh, by creating a single finance pool consisting of, of, of premium shares, and kind of sounds like an insurance company so far, right? But 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 the difference is there's don't there's no traditional intermediary within this arrangement like an insurance company, so yeah, that that's the contrast there, and so. And how it works at the end of each of the cover coverage periods, um, all the available money is refunded to the peer members. So this way, you know, customers have the ability to, to minimize their costs and mitigate claim conflicts. So if an insured has a, a loss event 
uh, they'll go to the portal. Uh, they, they'll report a claim, you know, via that portal, uh, and they'll get coverage. Um, and as soon as their contract uh, expires, you know, again, the monies that are left over, pre-agreed cash back, um, are, is refunded to all the available uh, members. Uh, there are some inherent flaws with this because everything is not panacea here. Um, a lot of drawbacks, um, certainly susceptible to fraud. Um, as I stated before, you build it and they'll find a way around it. Uh, so, so fraud is certainly a sensitivity within that. Uh, there are ethical aspects uh, that, that, that's associated with that. And, and, and there, believe it or not, that, that there's difficulty with achieving that consensus for a lot of those members. So um, we found that everybody don't typically trust each other when they come into those pools. Uh, from time to time, but you know it, it's an emerging trend, but but certainly not fully baked out um, at this point. Sounds a little bit like a captive. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, uh, Matthew. And one last thing with you. Um, see, if you look at the IoT analytics, uh, the the global number of connected uh, IoT devices, I think they expect to likely grow nine percent, with twelve point three billion active endpoints. So what will this mean to the uh, the property and casualty industry, uh, especially in lowering the underwriting costs? It, it, this, this is huge. Um, you know, the Internet of Things, you know, IoT, um, what it is, it describes the physical objects where they have embedded sensors and software uh, that have the ability to connect and, and, and talk with other devices. And if you think about the traditional old way in which we assess risk within our industry, um, we rely on very impersonalized databases. Uh, but today, uh, with IoT um, and even social media, we, we have a way to provide large amounts of, of data that's personal to the consumer. So this approach can help insurers and customers. So from a customer standpoint, you, you can get cheaper rates, better coverage, um, personalized if there's a need. Uh, for the, the insurers, uh, more accurate uh, risk assessment um, and, and satisfied clients. And a couple examples on, on the health insurance side and property and casualty with health insurance. And I think it was Alan was talking about, you know, making sure that we're mining the health of, of our consumers every day. You know, just think about it. If we're, you know, we we're talking earlier this morning about uh, smartwatches and I, I wear mine everywhere I go. You know, with these devices, these wearables, so it provides very deep insights into the customer's physical condition, their blood pressure, temperature, you know, how active they are, how many steps they take um, each day, even how long they brush their teeth. Um, and, and this is a, a, a very accurate way to assess rates there. Um, very useful from a property and casualty standpoint. Um, the IoT it allows the ability for underwriting to have greater insights on potential, ri potential risk without the expense of having a physical inspection of that problem. Um, you know, for instance, um, you know, with these sensors, um, you know, we're better at loss mitigation. And, and an example of that is dishwashers. So if you have a dishwasher, a smart dishwasher at home, um, if there's a water leak, uh, then that dishwasher can shut off your water system. So there's no further damage. So mitigate your damage there and also alert the owner. So there's just a lot of possibilities and a lot of opportunity for more rate accuracy uh, for the insurer. And it also benefits the, the consumer. Excellent. Thanks, Maggio, for all your views. And uh, I have just two more topics to cover, one with Alan, and then probably I'll ask Arvin to uh, publish the poll results in a in few minutes. So, Alan, uh, how do we properly employ uh, the AI uh, in technology platforms uh, that helps to achieve the stated goals and objectives? Uh, maybe like your voice is, uh, maybe if you can come closer to the mic, Alan. Yep. Uh, still, still closer, yeah. But meanwhile, I'll take that poll, poll results probably. Arvind, why don't you publish the poll results? Uh, sure, sure, Raj. So the, I'll read out the question. So the global insure tech market size was estimated at 3.85 billion US dollar in 2021. And 
is expected to reach. 80% have said that 5.445 billion and 20% say that it's 4.5 billion. Great. And what does the expert say? You guys agree, Rick, Alan, Mazio? Is this the range that what? Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I thought higher, but um, you know, I, I I don't I don't know. I I thought it was uh, a higher figure than 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 those. Um, I I couldn't try mm-hmm. to hazard a guess, but. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we are pretty close there. I mean, we will be knowing it in, in a few weeks. Uh, so, Adam, is laughing, so he, he knows the answer, I think. <laughs> I, I know the answer, so I... <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason I didn't ask him. <laughs> What's the answer, Maceo? It is $5.4 billion, $5.45 $5. billion dollars. Uh, it expected to be the, the investment in technology. In so, so then, but I thought it was higher. So then, it is the highest of any. Oh no, it's not eight billion. So it's no. not going to reach eight billion. Okay, no, not quite. Okay, got it. Uh, Alan, are you back? Uh, yeah. Good? Can you hear me? Uh, now? Yeah. Now it is better. Let, let's okay. wrap up with your response. Yeah, I know we are pretty okay. close. Yeah. Um, there he is. We lost. Him. We lost you, man. Yeah, go ahead again. And then uh, we can you come closer? Yeah. Um, no, no. Probably like uh, you can try connecting back. Is it okay? Or while we wait for Alan, I mean, Rick or Mazio, feel free to you know jump on this topic. Like my question is. How do we properly employ AI in technology platforms that helps to achieve stated goals and objectives? You know, feel free to share your perspectives. I think Alan is back. Okay. Yeah. Go um, ahead. <laughs> yeah. If you can hear me um, now, really, you know, for my purposes, uh, I want to use AI um, to give me information that I need to use to help my clients, um, particularly in the, the healthcare uh, arena. So I want information, um, biometric data and information claims data, pharmacy data. Uh, and I want to be able to use AI to infer from that data what's going to happen in that employee population over the next few years. Uh, there is a lot of sensitivity to that. People, uh, as Rick mentioned, and rightly so, uh, that people are concerned about uh, their privacy. And so we have to be very careful with that, that we're looking at data in the aggregate. And uh, sometimes uh, we want to be able to use that data specifically for individuals so that we can reach out to them uh, and touch them with systems and programs that are going to be helpful to them. But uh, their employers really can't know that. Uh, They can't know what's going on um, in those systems and and programs um, because, you know, employees have a sensitivity about that, of course, and it can be well founded that their company might retaliate against them for uh, some medical information that's um, that's adverse to their risk that may cause some very um, high claims in the next few years. So we have to be careful with the use of technology and information. We have to use it wisely. Um, we have to protect it. And I feel like that's part of our role as consultants, um, that we have access to almost um, all of the, the data. And it can be not in the aggregate, but specific, but we have to be really careful with that. So let's uh, say in the self-insurance world, when we're um, when we're underwriting for uh, stop loss or reinsurance coverage, then specific claims uh, and information uh, on specific individuals uh, has to be shared with the insurance company. Uh, but that information has to be protected. And we can't share that with employers. And I have employers all the time ask me what's going on uh, in their employee population. And I tell them I'd love to tell you, um, but I really can't give you a lot of information specifically. I can tell you in the aggregate what's happening and what's going on and what we need to do uh, in the next few years to take care of that. Um, but it can't be shared individually. So we have to be, again, I'm kind of beating that drum uh, a lot, but we have to be careful with how we share information. That makes sense, Alan. Thank you. Uh, real quick, uh, you know, maybe we can, any closing comments from Rick? Um I think uh, it's been covered pretty well. I, I don't want to become redundant uh, in any way, but um, I guess I can say the bottom line is that 
uh, traditional insurance is being disrupted. And it's by the introduction, introduction of technology. Uh, it's called InsureTech. It offers customers a new way to do things, gathering information differently, executing contracts more efficiently, um, and analyzing information more accurately. And, and, and some may feel the insurance industry will be losing personal touch. Um, but InsureTech strives to offer lower, more custom, and more flexible coverage. So I, I think in summation, um, my, from my perspective, is that it, it, it should be used wisely. Use it when it makes sense. Uh, we, we've, disrupting the insurance industry is a good thing. But as I said, it's a state industry. It's slow to change. Um, we're, we're conservative by nature, most uh, insurance companies and, and brokers. And therefore, I, I think that uh, change will come. Change is demanded, uh, but only where it makes sense. And I think some fears that people may have, they, they, they will be relieved of their fears when they see it in action. Uh, you know, I, uh, that, that's going to be the natural course. And so, wow. once again, I think it's going to start out on a smaller scale with more personal lines and, and things of that nature, as opposed to large programs for a larger risk, um, certainly, but uh, aspects of AI and other insure tech uh, technology will be rolled out and help help the industry and help the people uh, do better and, and achieve more. So that's, that's my feeling about that. Absolutely. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I know, Nitin, uh, we have three minutes left. Uh, real quick, uh, any closing comments from Mazio or Alan? I, I can actually just rest on the, exactly what Rick shared. Um, technology is going to play a part. Um, it's it's, it's going to be um, an enablement uh, of those within our industry, but it will not replace everything we do. Insurance still requires um, a personal touch there. Um, it, and I might caution, I'll, I'll, I'll end how I've started. Um, it has to be very specific value-based goals um, established uh, when making those investments. And um uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. So it was a, certainly a pleasure to be with everyone today. Thanks, Michelle. It, Likewise. it was a pleasure. Absolutely. And I would say that it's a really exciting time. Um, mm -hmm. Change is happening so quick, so fast. I mean, I've been in the insurance industry 35 years and every year there's been change, but there's not been change like there is today. Um, so it's very exciting times. Thanks, Alan. Over to you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you, Yuvraj, for moderating this great panel discussion with some great speakers. Rick, Alan, Masio, means it was so engaging. And you know, I loved it. Every bit of it, actually. Thanks a lot, guys, for bringing your thought process and you know, making this panel discussion exciting one. So just to wrap up, we would like to thank our community partners, speakers, and attendees who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. We had some great set of panel speakers who came together to share thoughts. Just for your information, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube and Facebook page of our company. So you all can go and see the recording anytime. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the same. Also, we'd like to thank InfoVision, which is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, which is our technology partner. Digit7 also have a great innovation lab of 15,000 square feet in Richardson, Texas. And any one of you who are dropping by can always go to the office, have a look to see that. To understand more in depth, suggest any aspect, all of you can go through their website, which is infovision.com and digit7.io, and closely liaison with them. Further, there are lots more in store for this month and subsequent months as well, with focus on banking, financial insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, energy, utility, and so on. To so request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Thanks and do take good care of yourself. Have a lovely day and week ahead. Thank you Bye. all. Thank, Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Rick, I loved your bib. Are we, are we, are we off the uh, air? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that was great.